welcome to The Reasons We Smile with Dr. Kavitko, the show that brings you man-on-the-street interviews, celebrity guests, groundbreaking research, and heartwarming stories about the reasons we smile. Our show is also known as everything you've always wanted to know about dentistry, but we're too numb to ask. Hello, I'm General Dentist Dr. Kavitko, and thank you for joining me today. The following views and opinions do not necessarily reflect those of this station, its staff, management, or parent company. To hear a replay of this show or one of the great shows that previously aired, log on to TheReasonsWeSmile.com or iTunes, keyword Dr. Kavitko, or The Reasons We Smile. Listeners should not use Dr. Kavitko's comments and advice in place of an actual dental exam. Brighten your life with a smile that shows the professional touch of Dr. Kavitko. Time now for The Reasons We Smile with Dr. Kavitko. Call 459-9769 to discuss your dental issues. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kavitko. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reasons We Smile. I'm Dr. Kavitko. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Today is episode 660 of The Reasons We Smile, and what we're going to do today is bring you part two of excerpts from a presentation by Dr. John A. Molinari, Ph.D., Professor Emeritus, University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry on Vaccines, Their Science, Perceptions, and Myths. Okay? In about 10 minutes, you're going to have a chance to win free flowers from DeSantis Florist. They'll be delivered to your place of business this Tuesday afternoon. If you want to pre-program that number into your phone, it is 614-459-9769. That's 614-459-9769. Don't call yet. We're going to do that in about 10 minutes. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, it's at Dr. Kavitko. And if you'd please go to my office Facebook page and like us, that would be awesome. It's Dr. Kavitko and Associates. Okay? So yeah, uh, last week when we were doing the show, I realized that we really didn't have enough time to completely cover the topic, an important topic, that something that's on everyone's mind right now, is are we going to have a vaccine for COVID-19 soon? which is also known as SARS-CoV-2. The answer to that question is not very soon, according to history. Okay, and if you were tuned in last week, you would remember that we talked about just how many years it took to develop vaccines for some of the other well-known issues that we have. The most modern one would be hepatitis B, which took 16 years to develop a vaccine. Uh, we first discovered it in 1965, and it took us till 1981 to develop a vaccine. Okay, so that's pretty sobering. And so we think we're going to be living with uh, COVID-19 for a while, but we do know that there is a lot of research going on and that there are five different prospects right now, five different possible vaccines under study and development, and that's good news. Why? Because as an example... U.S. childhood infections per year before vaccines. Polio, for example, paralyzed 10,000 children per year before the vaccine. Rubella, German measles, birth defects and mental retardation in as many as 20,000 newborns per year prior to development of its vaccine. Measles infected about 4 million children, killing 3,000 each year before its vaccine was uh, put into use. Diphtheria, one of the most common causes of death in school-aged children, uh, is now under control due to vaccines. Haemophilus influenza type B caused meningitis in 15,000 children per year prior to its vaccine being implemented. Pertussis, also known as whooping cough, killed thousands of infants before its vaccine was developed. And chickenpox, 4 million cases a year in 1994, as recently as 1994, before the chickenpox vaccine. And by the way, we still don't have a vaccine for, besides hepatitis, like I mentioned, be, uh, for HIV, AIDS, or hepatitis C. And of course, we don't have one for SARS-CoV-2. So let me just tell you why it's so challenging. What takes so long? There are certain steps that have to be followed when you're developing a new vaccine, stages of vaccine development and release. So the first one is an exploratory stage with basic lab research. They identify possible natural or synthetic antigen candidates. They do animal studies to test effectiveness and safety. You have the preclinical stage, which is tissue culture systems and animal studies to determine immunogenicity, safety, and immune response capabilities. It can also suggest safe starting dose and safe administration method. And many candidates never progress beyond this stage because they determine that they're just not going to work. 
if they do have one that is showing promise, however, the next step is investigational new drug application to the FDA for approval. So this is where things could be fast-tracked, but up until that point, you can't fast-track basic lab research. And then after the investigational new drug application is filled out and approved, then you have to do clinical development, phase one through phase three. And I think we talked about that last week. Phase one is where they tested on anywhere from 20 to 100 people. Phase two is where they tested on several hundred volunteers. And phase three is where they do it on hundreds or thousands of volunteers. And by the way, it's probably interesting to note right here that many vaccines undergo a phase four test, which is formal and ongoing studies after vaccine release. Okay. Also, then there would be regulatory review and approval, manufacturing, and then ongoing quality control, vaccine safety, for example. Okay, so that's the challenge, folks. That's why we don't have one yet. And yes, we have a lot of very smart people, but they have to go through these steps. You can't shortcut most of those steps. The only thing you can kind of take a shortcut on is the FDA using all of its resources to try to get their part finished more quickly. Coronavirus has some specific challenges. One would be ensuring vaccine safety, which of course that's basic. Previous research on SARS vaccines showed improvement in animal survival but did not prevent infection. Some vaccines also can cause lung damage. These things must be thoroughly tested for short and long-term adverse reactions. They must provide long-term protection. I saw on the news the other night that there's now at least one documented case of somebody who had COVID-19, recovered from it, and now has it again. So the vaccine has to be able to fight against this thing happening, which means it has to provide years of protective immunity. Also, it needs to protect older people, and people older than age 50 are at a higher risk for severe disease. Older people do not respond to vaccines as well as younger people, and so the ideal COVID-19 vaccine would have to work well for older people. So I think it might be helpful here to talk about the final flu season numbers for 2019-2020. This is from the CDC, June 2nd of 2020. So between October 1st of 2019 and April 4th of 2020, the seasonal flu in the United States resulted in 39 million to 56 million illnesses, 410,000 to 740,000 hospitalizations, 24,000 to 62,000 total deaths, and 169 pediatric deaths. So we don't, and we had a flu vaccine but here's the thing, each year it kind of mutates, if you will, it changes a little bit. And so each year the researchers have to kind of guess which strain is it that we need to develop our vaccine against. And it's a moving target. But they do pretty well, they really do. And with flu season coming up real quickly upon us, in fact, uh, I think Dr. Fauci said you should get your flu vaccine in September when it's first available. With that coming up, and of course the symptoms are very similar to COVID-19, health professionals are very concerned that the hospitals are going to be overrun with flu people with the flu when in fact it's COVID-19 or vice versa. So yeah, get your flu shot. That's one thing you can absolutely do to make things better on everyone. That would be one. The other would be do your best to stay safe, and that means wearing your mask all the way over your nose and mouth all of the time. And when you can't wear a mask because you're chewing or drinking, make sure you're at least six feet away from the other folks and make sure you wash your hands on a regular basis. And that, you know, I wear gloves when I head out, so you can, uh, you could do that too. Now, the uh, flu virus transmits person to person, just like COVID-19. So respiratory droplets, so when we cough or sneeze, those droplets can be propelled up to three feet. Now, we're telling people stay six feet apart, and that's the reason, because um, I think there's some research that says it can go further, but at least six feet, and if you can do it a, a greater distance, then do that as well. So I'm going to stop myself here for just a second and apologize. I apologize that this stuff is so main mundane, it's actually kind of boring, and I know that it would be easy just to like tune out, right? But this is affecting everybody's life. This could kill you. It could kill your friend. It could kill your mom, your dad, grandparent. And so we have to take it seriously. And I'm really actually impressed by how well we are coming along and how we have been able to figure out that we need to have these plastic shields, you know, at a business and people wearing masks and, 
and uh, you know, uh, eating at restaurants uh, spaced apart and having the outdoor patios open. That's all really, really good. It's really important because obviously we do want to get back to uh, normal life as much as possible. And let me talk about the um, the reason that getting vaccinated, say, for a flu, since we do have a flu vaccine, is important. The benefits of the flu vaccine from 2018 to 19, approximately 49% of the U.S. population chose to get the vaccine. And this prevented an estimated 4.4 million flu illnesses. 4.4 million. That's more than the population of Los Angeles. It prevented 58,000 flu hospitalizations. That's about the number of students at The Ohio State University. It prevented 3,500 flu deaths which is equivalent to saving about 10 lives per day over the course of a year. Isn't that something? That's just, to me, that's just amazing. Now, I also want to talk about, uh, is it a cold or is it the flu? Okay, and that's something that we need to kind of keep in mind as well, because we don't want to run to the hospital because we think we have the flu which, or we think we have COVID-19. So here are some things to pay attention to. One would be, uh, okay, let's do it like this way. Fever. In a cold, it's very rare in adults and older children, but can be as high as 102 Fahrenheit in infants and small children. If it's the flu, it's usually 102, but can go up to 104 degrees and usually last three to four days. That's a long time to have a fever. Headache. It's very rare for in a cold for you to have a headache, but with the flu, it's sudden onset and can be severe. So you can have a sudden onset headache and it can be very severe. Muscle aches. In a cold, if you had just have a cold, it's very mild. In the flu, it's, you usually have muscle aches and they're often severe. In a cold, you it would be tiredness and weakness would be mild. But in if you have the flu, it's often extreme and can last two or more weeks. Extreme exhaustion. If it's a cold, you'll never have st extreme exhaustion, but you'll have it with a sudden onset and you can, and it can be severe when you have the flu. So all of a sudden you're just, just totally exhausted. You don't know why. Well, that could be a flu, but it's never a cold. Runny nose, you often have that with a cold, but you only have it sometimes with a flu. Sneezing, you often sneeze with a cold and you only sneeze sometimes with the flu. Sore throat, you often have it with a cold and only sometimes with a flu. And a cough, mild hacking cough with a cold, and usually it's mild and can become severe with the flu. And again, this is information from the CDC that was put together by Dr. Molinari. Isn't that interesting? So we try to remember those. You can go to thereasonswesmile.com and uh, play this back, and uh, that way you can you know write it down if you want to. Pay attention to, uh, in, in the future, you know, is my symptom because of a cold or the flu. Okay, so I told you at the beginning of the show that we're going to do Dr. Kovitko's question of the day about 10 minutes in. We're getting to that point here pretty soon. And so I want to kind of go over with you what you might find in the question. Because I want it to be easy. I want you to have a chance to win these flowers. I don't want to tax you this early in the morning. And so all you have to do is uh, pay attention to a few little things here. And um, you'll get the right answer. Now, whether you're the caller that wins, I don't know about that. Because we have multiple callers and we have to uh, pick. But for the question of the day, here's what you're going to have to remember. Okay? I want you to know this. Vaccines are not a risk factor for developing autism. I want you to know that babies cannot get too many vaccines too soon. And I want you to know that vaccines do not cause autoimmune disorders. I also want you to know that you cannot get the disease from the vaccine. Okay? Those are very, very important. And because I just mentioned them, they're fresh in your mind. So we're going to do Dr. Kvitko's question of the day. But before we do, we'd like you to listen to this. This station will not be held liable for any contesting during The Reasons We Smile with Dr. Kavitko. Participation in the contest allows Dr. Kavitko to record and broadcast your name and call. One winner per household, prizes are non-transferable, cannot be substituted, and are subject to taxes and fees. This station cannot be responsible for the inability to enter the contest, whether due to equipment malfunction or telephone difficulties. All decisions of Dr. Kavitko concerning this contest or eligibility are final. Thank you. 
And now it's time for Dr. Kavitko's Question of the Day. Okay, and don't forget, you can win free flowers from DeSantis Florist by calling in with the correct answer. The question is, which of the following statements is true? A. Viruses are not a risk factor for developing autism. B. Babies cannot get too many vaccines too soon. C. Vaccines cannot cause autoimmune disorders. D. You cannot get the disease from the vaccine. Or E. All of the above. All right. The winner's going to receive free flowers from DeSantis Florist. They'll be delivered to your place of business this Tuesday afternoon. The number to call, 614-459-9769. That's 614-459-9769. So go ahead and call now. You won't believe it, though. I want to hear your mind. And there's nothing else in the world tonight. She said people don't take the time. Hey, people don't take the time. Hey, what's going on? It's Keith Carlos, winner of America's Next Top Model and star of Chocolate City 2. You can look for my smile courtesy of Dr. Kavico on the CBS television network where I play Danny on the hit soap opera, The Bold and the Beautiful. Stay tuned to The Reasons We Smile with Dr. Kavico, the world's most interesting dentist. Hi, I'm Dr. Kavico. Well, we reopened back on May 1st, and I'm happy to say that things are going very well. Our patients are receiving the same great care we've always provided, and we are placing a huge emphasis on infection control. In addition to face shields, like the one I've worn since 1985, and of course exam gloves, my entire team is wearing surgical gowns and cap- and we are limiting the number of patients we have in the office at a time. I'm also happy to report that there's not been a single incident of COVID-19 associated with our office. Call us at 614-262-9588. Visit worldsmostinterestingdentist.com for more info about Dr. Kavitko. Dr. Kavitko, let's go! Hi, I'm Johanna, and I've been a dental patient at Dr. Kavico and Associates for over 10 years. I would really recommend Dr. Kavico for your family's dental care. They're friendly. They're always there to help me. I feel like family when I walk in the door. It's clean. It's comfortable. Even if I have to bring my kids, they have a great playroom for them. I know when I'm with Dr. Kavico, they are taking that extra time to make sure that I'm going to be the healthiest I can be. They've been great. I love them. Call Dr. Kavitko and Associates today, 614-262-9. Hi, this is Richard Simmons. Dr. Kavitko's here, and he's going to help you with all of your problems. Uh, are your teeth yellow? He can fix that. Are you missing a tooth? He can put a new one in. How is that? <laughs> That's very good. Thank you, Richard. Okay, we're back. We're doing Dr. Kavitko's question of the day. During the commercial break, my producer took the phone calls and has spoken to the winner. So please, my producer, please tell me who's the winner of Dr. Kavitko's question of the day. Who knew that the answer was all of the above? All of those statements were true. The winner of the free flowers this morning is Julie, and she's on the northwest side of Columbus. All right. Congratulations to our winner. Thank you for calling in. Thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it. For those of you who called but didn't win, please call back next week, okay? If you're just joining us, I'm Dr. Kavitko. This is episode 660 of The Reasons We Smile with Dr. Kavitko. Today we are bringing you part two of a show that we started last week. It was entitled Excerpts from a Presentation by Dr. John A. Molinari, Ph.D., Professor Emeritus, University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry on Vaccines, Their Science, Perceptions, and Myths. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground today, but we still have a little bit to go. And so let's get on with the next portion of this information I'd love you to have. Pneumococcal disease, or pneumonia, is a common cause of vaccine-preventable deaths. It's a common cause of children getting bacterial meningitis. About one of every four patients with pneumococcal pneumonia will develop pneumococcal bacteremia. And that's where bacteria are circulating through your bloodstream. And that's major infection. We already know how some bacteria are resistant to antibiotics, and so we don't really want to have to test them out to see just how many still work, right? We would try to prevent, or would wish to prevent, as many of these bacteremias as possible. And of course, this particular one, if somebody had the vaccine, would not have gotten, most likely at least, pneumonia in the first place. Another one is herpes zoster, known as shingles. Now, shingles is very painful. It's like 
itching and their scabs and you just can't leave it alone. And what that is, is the reactivation of the varicella zoster virus. It can occur years, even decades after you had the chicken pox. It's generally associated with normal aging and with anything that causes reduced immune competence. The lifetime risk is about 32%. In the U.S., there's an estimated half a million to a million annual cases of herpes zoster diagnosed. 50% of people less than 85 years old will develop herpes zoster or shingles. That's a lot. And again, that is preventable with a vaccine. Meaning, if you never got chicken pox, you wouldn't get shingles. So if you'd gotten the chicken pox vaccine when you were a kid, there you go. And so for those parents that don't believe in vaccines, here's another example of why you should have your children vaccinated. Let's talk a little bit about human papillomavirus, HPV. It's the most common sexually transmitted pathogen. 6.2 to 14.1 million new annual U.S. infections. An estimated 20 million people are infected. Get this, 100% of sexually active men and women will acquire genital HPV at some point in their lives. Now, the good news is, is there actually is a human papillomavirus vaccine. But the children, or rather it needs to be given to a, a youngster before they become sexually active. So that's the trick. You have to get your children uh, to the doctor or to the vaccine center, if you will, uh, at an early enough age, which is described as about age 9, 9 or 10. Okay? All right, so now measles. So last year, in 2019, there was quite a spike in the number of measles cases. We think they occurred for the following reasons. There was an increase in number of travelers who got measles abroad and brought it into the United States and or further spread of measles in the United States communities with pockets of unvaccinated people. For example, New York State. And by the way, many of you know there is a vaccine called MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. So that's also one that can be prevented, and it's one of those mixtures where you give the kids the, sa the vaccine all three at the same time, or it's all mixed together. While the measles vaccine itself was licensed in 1963, the combination of measles, mumps, and rubella was licensed in 1971. It has an excellent safety profile over the last 50 years, and there's been a 94% reduction in reported measles cases between 1980 and 2012. It's estimated that between 2000 and 2018, 23.2 million deaths have been prevented. Isn't that cool? 23.2 million deaths prevented. In general, by immunizing all babies in a given year, we prevent 14 million infections, save 33,000 lives, save $10 billion by the time the children reach adolescence. That's according to the CDC, as prepared by Dr. Molinari. Opting out, unfortunately, 2 to 3% of U.S. Uh, school-aged children whose parents have received religious or philosophical exemptions from state vaccination requirements, with that number increasing. And I wish it weren't. I think I've made that pretty clear. There are some misperceptions about vaccines. Myth one, quote, I am healthy, I don't need the flu vaccine, end quote. Of course, that's not true. Just because you're healthy doesn't mean you're not going to get the flu, and the vaccine is a good idea. Myth number two, the last time I got influenza vaccine, I came down with the flu. That's false. You cannot get the disease from the vaccine, period, period, period. Myth three, I had a tetanus shot as a child, so I don't need another one. End quote. That's false as well. You need a booster. Myth four, I already had shingles, so I don't need the vaccine. And obviously, that's not true. Myth five, some vaccines are not safe. That is absolutely, absolutely not true. In fact, think about it. If we were just going to put anything out there, whether we had tested it for safety or not, we'd probably have a vaccine for COVID-19 by now, but we don't. The FDA, the CDC, everybody waits until we are absolutely sure that this is not only effective, but safe. It's what we talked about at the very beginning of the show where we described the process. And so if you're avoiding vaccines because you don't think they're safe, you're just putting yourself and possibly your family at risk. Okay. Another myth is about, and we talked about it last week as well, but I want to mention it, is that this measles, mumps, and rubella mixture of vaccine causes autism. The initial 1998 report that uh, said that it did cause autism was retracted by The Lancet in 2010. The January issue of the British Medical Journal in 2011 quoted, Wakefield's work was not only bad science, but also deliberate fraud. 
Many large, well-designed studies found no link between measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine and autism. This study tracked over 6 million children. And that's a huge, huge number. It really is. And then there was one more thing that came about, and that is autism typically develops before the age at which you would vaccinate a child. So there just was no connection, and it's just very sad that somebody made that connection and then uh, convinced other people that there was a connection. And before you know it, uh, there are people saying, you know, I don't want vaccines, I don't want any vaccines. And then the rest of us suffer, right? Okay, so I'm looking at the clock, and it looks like it's time for us to go to a break. Stay with me. You're listening to The Reasons We Smile with Dr. Kavitko, episode 660, and we will be right back. You can take me as I am. Just a little bit I don't know who to be I'm a paper cup, baby, of the sea I know you see it too Cause you're too much for me This is Clark Kellogg Stay tuned for more of Dr. Kavitko Estás escuchando con Dr. Kavitko Aquí, en su sesión favorita Hi, I'm Dominique Reigert Like what you hear? Why not use the show to promote your product or service By becoming a sponsor Call 614-262-9588 to learn how. That's 614-262-9588. Call now. Hi, I'm Dr. Kavitko, general dentist and host of the Reasons We Smile Radio and Roadshow. I've been honored to help several famous people get a perfect smile, like Keith Carlos and Dominique Rygaard from America's Next Top Model and Ted the Golden Voice Williams from right here in Columbus. Isn't it time you had a celebrity smile? It costs less than you might think, and most of the time, it can be done in one visit. A new smile can make a world of difference. Visit worldsmostinterestingdentist.com for more info about Dr. Kavitko. I'm Grandpa, and I go to Dr. Kavitko, and I still have all my teeth. Real ones. Where's my glasses? Okay, so we're almost out of time, so I need to wrap this up quickly. I want to go over the dangers and risks of not vaccinating children. One, the disease can be more harmful than the risk of vaccine side effects. Parents too young to remember certain vaccine-preventable diseases, such as polio, smallpox, and rubella. Parents questioning why their children need vaccines in the first place. Increased concern regarding real and perceived side effects as disease incidence declines in the United States. The public's desire for absolute guarantees regarding vaccine efficacy and safety. But if we stopped vaccines altogether, the virtual elimination of polio could reverse. Measles could return. Meningitis could return. Pertussis could return. Rubella, chicken pox, hepatitis B, and mumps. And we don't want that. And remember, science is the one where facts matter more than opinions. Okay? Facts matter more than opinions. And the facts are, we need vaccines. Vaccines are safe. You should get your child vaccinated. And if we get a vaccine for COVID-19, please get the vaccine. I'm going to get it, and I hope you join me. Once it's available, of course. Well, looks like that is all the time we have today. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed it. Before we go, let me remind you, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, it's at Dr. Kivitko. And if you'd please go to my office Facebook page and like us, that would be awesome. Remember that all past episodes, complete with video, are available at TheReasonsWeSmile.com. Be sure to tune in next week and every week right here on your favorite station. Goodbye. This is Carly Red from Love and Hip Hop Atlanta, the hit show on VH1, urging you to tune in next week with my dentist, Dr. Kavitko. If you're interested in learning more about this and other dental health topics, go to TheReasonsWeSmile.com to access full episodes of Dr. Kavitko's show. If you'd like Dr. Kavitko, the world's most interesting dentist, to speak at your next event, please call 614-262-9588. That's 614 Two six two ninety five eighty eight, or send an email to speaking.